some guests with us. We're going to let them do their own introduction and tell you about Shady the Triceratops. You can pronounce it right. Fantastic. You're doing great. Uh, before you get started, I do want to tell you that in the room today, we do have our curator, Mr. Guy Darrell. Guy Darrell is the person that has constructed every one of those dinosaurs downstairs. And he owns everything in this museum except this one room here, which is the St. James. So he owns all of it. He has set it up. He's also done all the write-up on the displays. Great job. Thank you, guys. Oh, it's good. Guys, you're up. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm John Tosi. Uh, I have uh, my history with, uh, with dinosaurs has been my sort of lifelong obsession, I'll say it that way. Uh, when I was in high school, you all know about Mastodon Park, um, we were doing the excavations to build a sewer treatment plant and they started finding the bones again in that fluvial plain. And it was a neat new discovery. And so that just enhanced more of my obsession. So. Uh, but I went to Westminster College in Fulton, Missouri and I tried to stay close to the school. And David has been a professor there for the last 10 years, 11 years. Uh, David is a paleontologist by training in geology and environmental sciences. Uh, he has done study in Kansas and in Texas. And he has had a lease uh, with the National Forestry Service in South Dakota in a particular place. It's near Lemon, it's uh, called Shade Hill. And it's a beautiful Grand Forks River, beautiful prairie land. And he has developed a relationship with the town as well as many of the ranchers, and they look after us. We go every summer. He's been going probably since 2012. And about five years ago, one of the ranchers was out checking the fence lines and found a little piece of bone sticking out of the ground and called David and said, Hey, you might want to come and look at this piece. And so the rest is history as far as shade goes, and I'll let David take it from you. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm, I'm David Schmidt, and um, as John mentioned, I'm an associate professor at Westminster College, and uh, my areas of uh, specialty are in paleontology and sedimentology. I'm trained as a geologist and in through paleontology as well. Um, I've been there, so I'm starting my 11th year now at Westminster College, and uh, we've had some exciting things happen over the last several years, and uh, one of those exciting things is this. Um, I am actually from the Kansas City area. I, I kind of, I'm born and raised in uh, Leavenworth, Kansas, but spent a lot of time back and forth across the, the state line uh, throughout my years. Um, I did end up at Texas Tech University where I got my doctoral degree in the geosciences there. Um, I attended University of Missouri, Kansas City uh, for my Bachelor of Science in Geology and then went to Fort Hayes State University for my Master's degree. So along the way, I, I kind of went through that training of, of paleontology and, and the geosciences, a very traditional uh, route that I took. And by the time I got to Westminster College, I brought with me um, this interest in paleontology and some of the experiences that I had had previously and wanted to establish a research program there at the, at the institution and I got a lot of students and, and members within the community around Fulton involved and it's been really exciting what we've been doing over the last few years. And My goal today is to talk to you about this, uh, this, this discovery of, of Shady, we call Shady. Um, the name Shady comes from the, the community of Shady Hill, which John had also mentioned in his introduction. And um, that's just in honor of the people that were there because they were fantastic people. They're just, they embraced this as one of their own. They were very helpful in the whole process and have been excited about what we've been doing over the last four years and very involved in some way. So in honor of them, we called it Shady. Um, which gives it that kind of like gender neutral. We don't know if it's a male or female. We hypothesize that the Triceratops is a male based on the size, but uh, we don't have really good conclusive evidence to suggest that. So we want something a bit more neutral, and we thought Shady was a good name for it. Um, so my goal is to talk about uh, Shady and like the, how that all kind of came into fruition and then talk about what we've learned from it so far. We're really still just scratching the surface as far as the research is concerned and what we've been able to obtain. Um, and then obviously leave some time for some questions. And we brought in some really fun uh, pieces as well to, to show you as well. So, um, and please feel free to ask me questions along the way. Um, there's, you know, I'm, I'm completely open to kind of a free form sort of style. So 
Uh, this is the, uh, the picture that uh, kind of got circulated in the media after the discovery uh, back in 2020. And uh, this is the field crew, the, the original, the OG field crew that, uh, that took place in, in 2020. Uh, it was actually discovered in, in 2019, and um, here we are, Perkins County, this is uh, South Dakota, so we're up in that northwest part of the state. And um, right up here, the northeast section of that county, and again, uh, the Grand River is fairly close as a geographic feature. And um, this is kind of uh, what we saw the very first year in 2019. So after the rancher made that initial discovery, um, they let us, uh, the National Forest Service let us go in and, and do a little bit of a survey, a kind of a ground survey ourselves. So we couldn't recover anything, we couldn't dig, we couldn't do anything because we didn't actually have that part of our permit yet. But we went in to just do a preliminary survey to see what we thought. These are the first things that we saw. Um, this is uh, part of the... Uh, uh, this is part, actually part of the pelvis that was sticking out. This is some of the, the vertebrae uh, fragments that were laying on the ground. So we were able to take some pictures, do kind of analysis, and what we recognized that bones were actually sticking out in this horizon that were in place in the ground, but there were a lot of pieces and fragments that had eroded down the slopes. We thought, you know, the first thing that we would do if we get access to this is try to, try to recover all those fragments on the surface and then begin the excavation process. So this is what we saw first. Uh, this is still the same year, and this is looking south in the field site, and I've circled the area right here. Under this, this is a, an iron stone resistant cap right there, and underneath that is a, a sand. Uh, and it's a pretty friable sand, and this is where most of the skeleton is, is, is encased in. And right here, there's a boundary right here, so this is sand, and then right here underneath that is a, is a mud, mudstone. Uh, pretty soft mudstone. It's right at that contact, right at that boundary where all the bones are basically in that same horizon. And you can trace that kind of going throughout this little drainage area in here. So that's where the skull of Shady is located, is right there in that little resistant cap. So now we're looking at kind of like a southeast view um, of that same area. And so there's the skull underneath here. That's that iron stone. And down, you can actually see some of the right, maybe not where you're sitting, <laughs> I'm sorry, it's too far away. Um, but these right here are fragments that are just coming down the slope in these drainages right here. And again, that's all kind of in this horizon right along there. So is this on U.S. Forest Service land? That's correct, yeah. This is National Forest Service, um, and it's... How the ranch are ever... That's right, you've got a steep slope there. When you walk a lot, well, those guys are amazing. They're like mountain goats, so they walk around the land, wow. and they really do take care of the cattle. But the, you know, the Forestry Service. If you look at America, you know, we own half of the country, and so when the ranchers have their spots, they check their fence lines, and they're all really very astute at seeing stuff that's sticking out. But literally, this is that furthest twenty yards from their property line. So they always come out and want to make sure that we're staying on. Forestry land, because <laughs> when it goes onto their land, then they own it. <laughs> yeah, that, that's actually how how this was discovered. Was the the ranchery is part of the grazing association, so they go out and repair fence lines for, for property boundaries. The problem is with the, the fence line that was put in. It was put in decades ago, so it doesn't really represent the true boundary. The Forest Service has actually had to go out and survey what the actual boundary is, which is about two meters just to east of where that fence line was. Well, we're still, we're still on Forest Service property, but we're getting ever so closer to the private <laughs> landowner's property, who's fantastic, by the way. Um, the private landowner actually allows us access to get to that, to get to our field site. He's been a great, but again, one of the members of the community of Shade Field has just been really, really accommodating. He yeah, actually so brought a tractor out and built a road for us. So. Yeah, <laughs> granted it out for us, which is really helpful. Uh, it's pretty isolated where we are. <laughs> this is what the land looks like. Yeah, I'm not sure. So the cattle are grazing in this foreground. Right. And it's and you can see where the plateaus are. Yeah. Where they where the greenery is and then these arroyas develop and that's what's happening environmentally today. The reason we're fighting these bones is because we get washouts and more severe weather and wind. Yeah, yeah and so this this gentleman that we found this, uh, his name's Jim Berry, and we decided to name the quarry after him since he made the discovery. Um, he's one of these guys that when he's out in the field doing this kind of work, he's always keeping his eyes on the ground. He knows where he is. He knows his, he knows his surrounding. 
he knows the history, the, the heritage that's, that's you know, kind of been ingrained into that culture, particularly with uh, paleontology in that area. So he's always on the lookout for these sorts of things. Um, he's got a good eye. Got a pretty good eye. So this uh, right here, this is a, a cylindrical piece right there. That's actually the right brow horn. So the skull was laying on its left side with its right cheekbone sticking up, and the right brow horn is what you see right there. Fragments of it are kind of eroded. That's there's a fragment there, and some other fragments have eroded down the slope. This is also uh, a part of the horn as well. It's one of the brow horns, uh, the right brow horn. And so we got all these fragments that have kind of accumulated in these drainages. And so uh, just to give you a, a good representation, there's lots of different ceratopsians out there, but this is pretty classic, uh, kind of an iconic sort of figure what triceratops looks like. It gives you some sort of size relationship. Um, just to show you how big Triceratops can get. Pretty big, pretty big. So this is, I'm um, advancing now to 2020, so we're skipping ahead a year um, after our preliminary survey, and now we have the permit, we can go in and do our excavation. So the very first thing that we did, we, we stripped all the vegetation off so we could see that bare ground to see what was exposed there. You see the pink little markers there, those are flags where we're finding bone all it's just basically everywhere. And again, this horizon right in here, this is that, that, that pay zone, that's where it is. Um, so we removed all the vegetation, exposed all the fragments, and then we collected those fragments and, and made little maps of those, little field maps, and we took a lot of notes on this. And then we were able to start excavating back into the wall, or excavating into the south wall, so in that direction is the east, and this is to the west. The private landowner is over here. Uh, but we left the skull kind of exposed. You can see so there's the right brow horn. The nasal horn is right there. Um, and so we've worked our way back in. It doesn't look like this at all now. We've, we've really <laughs> made a lot of progress over the last four years. But as we continue cutting back into this wall, we find more and more. We uh, eventually found, and this is pretty close to where the skull was, this is the left part of the frill, this is the squat muscle which comes over here up to this side, and so I would say maybe just about a meter, maybe a little less than a meter away from the skull, and so showing you where that is in, in relative position, but I've used my student here who's got plaster all over her hands, uh, he's her for scale, this is Colette, she graduated a couple of years ago, and she's about 5'2". Um, and the, so the, the bone comes down to about right in here. The rest of this is kind of more, more or less matrix, but we do have some fragments. So you can see, again, this is a pretty, pretty large individual that we're dealing with. This is one of the vertebrae that we found in that first season. Um, the neural canal is right here. We've got two transverse processes and then the neural spine. You know, in the field, they look exquisite. They look incredible. When you get them back into the lab and you start really getting into the nitty-gritty part of the preparation, you realize just how much damage has occurred over 65 million years. With the ground expanding and contracting when it freezes and thaws, and the clays that swell when they, when they take on moisture and then they contract when they dry out. And then you can see there's just tons of roots. These bones were fairly shallow, and so the roots were able to really penetrate and do a lot of damage. And so the same reason that we find at this level is the same reason the roots go along that clay layer. It's water. Right, yeah. Um, and, but just done a lot, of, a lot of damage. They look beautiful in the field, but in the lab, they, yeah, there's a lot of work. Very, very meticulous. So right here, these are uh, two of our students that are excavating around two very large rib bones. I, when I look at this picture, I can't help thinking about what the Cretaceous barbecue was like. Um, I'm from Kansas City, and I like barbecue, so um, I'm kind of jealous that I didn't have an opportunity to, to you know, have that experience. But again, just giving you a really good idea of the size, you can see like how we excavate this. So as we're as we're going along, what we do is create a pedestal. So we kind of dig around this and dig underneath it a little bit. What we're going to do is put plaster on top of that, and the plaster encases that. And what we can do is then flip that over and then plaster the top of that. That way we can transport this back to our lab and because we're traveling hundreds of miles back to Missouri, so we want to try to protect it as best we can in that plaster jacket. And that's the process that we do. This is a beautiful piece right here. Um, it looks perfect. Uh, it does have some, some fractures on the back side of this though. 
It's very damaged. It looked like it was maybe stepped on. Um, it's crushed on the, on the back side, and some of that sediment is actually filled inside into the bone. Um, John did a CT scan for, was it last year? It was last year, about a year ago. And you can see how that, that sediment has penetrated into the bone of that fracture. This was probably pre-fossilization. The fracture that, that took place was probably pre-fossilization. Um, so shortly after it was deceased, it got crushed, and then the sediment filled in. This is all the sand that I was talking about, and it's very friable, it's pretty easy to work in. Now, I, I understand that the parasaur that was found near here is not the same, it's a pretty difficult mud, uh, mudstone or mud rock that you're working in. Um, I, I, I'm not envious at all because I, I'm spoiled. Uh, we, John and I were talking about how spoiled we are, how easy it is to remove this matrix here. So I, I'm very lucky. I, I'm really lucky. Yeah, you don't need to come and see this because it would ruin all of your excavation. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is the radius, so that's in the, the fore, forearm here. That's my wife, and again, I like to use people for scale just because it's pretty impressive the size that we're looking at. This is the, the shoulder blade right here. This is the scapula. This is the coracoid that makes up part of that shoulder girdle. So if you reach back there, you, if you've got that bony projection right there, that's your shoulder blade or your scapula back there. Um, so um, she's also pretty close to, I think this is the lower jaw, so the dentary right here. And then it's the this size is, of a surfboard, that thing is huge. It's, yeah. This is a very big triceratops. It's probably in the top ten of all of them that have been found easily. Mm -hmm. it's pretty good size. Um, we, it, so here's the skull. I try to outline it, but it's a really bad sort of illustration. But I think it, I think it does the job. We got the frill right here. This is the right cheekbone. This is the eye socket right here. The right brow horn coming off right above the eye. The nasal horn, and then the beak uh, was missing. The, we have the tooth, the tooth row right here on both sides. Um, there's a lot of bone that's trapped on underneath that. We, we're not able, we haven't been able to get to that yet, and, and hopefully we're finding more fragments that we can fill in the places that are missing that hopefully might be trapped underneath there. It's quite a bit actually that's trapped underneath the skull. Um, and I'll talk a, bit, a, a little bit more about how these bones actually kind of acted as a dam for uh, flowing water on the surface to trap other other fragments and other sort of organic debris and things like that. So this is a uh, uh, the skull and a little bit farther along in the excavation process here. And so, yeah, this is huge. Um, so it, it doesn't look like a skull because it's kind of amorphous <laughs> looking, but uh, we got it on this big column right here. And uh, we had a visitor, which was interesting. Like every night we finish up, we put a tarp over it, and we come in, come in the morning, take the tarp off, and this little guy would make a nest. Uh, just kind of interesting to see. There's a little tiny mammal on top of this, like 65, 9 year old gigantic reptile. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, and that's, that's, this is the, the, the organism that made that nest. So we would follow him around and try to take a picture of him. Finally, one day he was cooperative and didn't get too freaked out. Um, so that was kind of fun. But what we decided to do was to get the skull on two columns like this and then just keep narrowing the columns down. We excavated enough underneath here to put a pallet. And so once we just trim off, eventually we just come to rest, and that's exactly what it did. I can't believe it worked out that way. Just like your plan. It was just like your plan. It never happens. And that's, that's, that's a true story. What we did, like, a few nights before, kind of like where we are right here at this stage, my colleague and I were sitting around the campfire like, how are we going to do this? It's just the two of us. How are we going to do this? Um, after a few tasty beverages, we came up with some work pretty good. We had, like, six different ways that we were going to do this. And uh, we finally came with one that we just kept coming back to, like, I, we feel like this is the best technique. And that's so, sometimes this is what it requires. It's just a little bit of innovation and a tasty beverage to figure out what you need. <laughs> with, with the plaster, we have to be back maybe a ton or less? The, or with um, the skull, the matrix, and the plaster, it's about 3,500 pounds all, all together. Um, we, had it on a, we had it on a skid steer. It was about 3,000 pounds, and it kept tipping the skid steer, so we, like, four or five of us had to jump on the back of that to, to balance it out, so pretty, yeah, pretty heavy, <laughs> very heavy. 
So there's the pallet. Um, it's Garrett's dog. <laughs> Sadly, we lost our best cat too many this year. She died this year. Yeah, so. passed away this past summer. Um, pretty old, but uh, we continued to trim down the columns here until they got thinner and thinner. And eventually, just rested on right on the pallet. So this is the day that we got it out of the field. We brought in a backhoe to do that, and we got it all ready with the toe straps. And this was like the most stressful, but the most exciting day in my entire <laughs> life. And Shady, for me uh, personally, is the highlight of my career so far. This is I've never had anything quite as exciting as this. Um, I, I just don't believe that this is going to be my last exciting thing. I, mean, <laughs> I think the future still holds some. Uh, uh, at least I hope, I hope it holds some interesting and, and exciting things as well. But this was a very stressful day, but we managed to get it out and eventually got it onto a flatbed. And uh, I took a picture as we were driving out of the field. You can see what the terrain kind of looks like here. It's that Badlands topography that's very typical of the grasslands up there. So a very exciting moment. On the flatbed, I felt pretty good at this point once we got it out. Uh, there's still challenges ahead of us because we got to get back into, uh, we got to get into Westminster. And so this is now, we've arrived in Fulton. This is the science building. We put it on this cart. The very first cart that we built broke all the, the wheels. Just, I mean, we moved it. I don't even think we moved it a foot. They just went. <laughs> <laughs> so back to the drawing board. Um, we got the second cart in. They got wheels that were engineered to hold a lot more weight. And so um, we built the cart, wheeled it in. It took eight of us to wheel it inside. Um, we were able to put it into a storage unit that's big enough to hold that. So. All the material that we have brought back, we have brought to our prep lab, and so this is kind of like the process of preparation, using sand to kind of hold things in place and see where we filled in parts of it. The good thing about this is that we are able to retain probably 90 to 95% of the fossil bone material. Um, a lot of these areas are so badly damaged by our roots, by the time we get them into the lab and look at it, it just falls apart into dust. Uh, but other parts do remain pretty well intact. So it's this is an amazing complete dinosaur relative to typically typical finds. And, and we found theoretically all ribs, which is amazing. And so we're about two-thirds of the way into the animal anatomically, and we'll see what happens as we still continue to Yeah, I do have a uh, uh, at the end of the present toward the end of the presentation I have a kind of an illustration that shows the pieces that and filled, filled in the skeletal parts that we have recovered. Um, I have not filled in the, the ones we found from this past summer, but it gives you a good idea, I think, of, of what we've been able to recover so far. So here's some of our students and volunteers in the community that have um, been a part of the project and helped out and uh, then prepping uh, our specimen. This is the frill here, and again, some of those rib bones that we've been finding. And this is like kind of what it looks like. And, uh, John's uh, creativity and, and, and his skill set up the hat helped to create some of the armatures for the pieces. So we've got a dorsal rib and the vertebrae. This is a cervical rib. I've got a human backbone here to give you an idea just for scale. That if the metric system doesn't do anything for you, then you can use this to look at it as far as a frame of reference. That's the radius that I was, uh, I showed you a picture uh, previously. And those are all complete. So what have we learned at this point? Uh, we've learned some really interesting things. We've got a long way to go. We're just scratching the surface. And so some of the things that um, I'll talk about, I'll start with this first in terms of like the settings that the bones were encased in, talk about the environment at that time, the depositional environment at that time, and some of the other clues that we're, that we're finding as we um, continue to excavate. So this is looking into the south wall. As I mentioned, this is sand. We think that this is sand that was deposited on a floodplain. We've done some grain size analyses, and I'll show you that in here just a second a little bit, um, and show you kind of the evidence to support this. But um, these little structures that you see right here, those are cross beds. Cross beds are formed in either running water or wind. They can transport these sediments, and they produce these little inclined planes in the dark. Um, little streaks that you see in there on those inclined planes, it's, it's just loaded with organics. There's a lot, a lot of organics that are preserved in here. So that's all this residual uh, organic material that was building up, deposited on the floodplain. 
early on the ranchers would find many coal deposits in this area that you know weren't big, but it helped them get through some winters. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's quite a bit of coal that's preserved out there. And by the way, this is in the Hell Creek Formation. I forgot to mention that early on, uh, which is a really well-known locate or well-known rock formation that contains the latest Cretaceous dinosaurs here in, in North America. Um, and so this sand with these cross beds that were formed in running water. Uh, with depositing these, these organics help us reconstruct that, what that ancient uh, depositional environment was like. And so the dark pieces here, it's not the best quality image, it's kind of lost its resolution, but uh, all that, that's all the dark pieces that's co coated with this organic film that was preserved uh, by many of these organics that were trapped in the sediments. So I know you don't want to look at this because this is too scientific. Uh, I'll try to explain this the best that I can. Um, so the sediments that we took at our field site, uh, again, the Hell Creek Formation, this is the grain size distribution. So on this axis right here, this is really coarse, and then as you work this way, very fine grain sort of stuff. And so you can see that what the distribution looks like. So what we decided to do is we took samples from the modern stream. So these three samples are from the modern stream. It's a stream that's actually close to Westminster College. We sampled inside the channel of that stream. We sampled um, adjacent to the channel on the floodplain, and then we sampled in this third one farther away from the channel on the floodplain. And you can see the grain size distribution. This here has got a lot more coarser material, and the average is probably somewhere in here. The average is probably here, so it's slightly shifted just a little bit. Um, you can see um, the, no, this one is yeah, this one is the closest one to the channel, and this this distribution is farther away from the channel. So we think that it's probably somewhere between these two, as the average probably here is closer to the average here. This is the distal, um, the one that's farther away from the channel. So again, just having this kind of data helps us to, to <coughs> either reject or keep the hypothesis that we have. It's the, the example of that here is Mastodon Park. It's a big fluvial plain, and all of the bones, you know, it's displayed up on the hill, but the bones were found down in the sand where the water was. And that's so typical of fossilization. It's always about the water. Yeah. You anybody know what that is? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's, uh, we're finding lots of amber, and actually this past summer we found a log uh, that was trapped by the bones that probably, probably part of that flow that has a huge seam of amber inside of it. Absolutely beautiful. When we when we broke it open, I, all of us that were standing around it just went. <gasps> it was a really yeah. pretty cool moment. Uh, but we're finding lots of amber. No insects or anything preserved in the amber yet, but we haven't got to process everything to see. Uh, so we'll we'll continue that. We also have an internal mold of a gastropod. A lot of the sediment that are still stuck on there. You can kind of see the world a little bit. Use your imagination. Uh, <laughs> So gastropod, we also found an aquatic turtle. This actually was about, the right here, there's a brush. Right next to it is the skull of the triceratops, so maybe 50 centimeters, half a yard or so. Uh, we found this aquatic turtle right next to the skull. So we've also been looking into the life history and post-mortem history uh, of um, shading. So what maybe was going on while it was alive, also what happened to it after, after death. So what we have found are some really interesting things. I already talked about this. This is the fracture here. So this is post-mortem damage to the bone where it got crushed in sand and debris was filling in on the inside right here. This is that CT scan that John did for us. And uh, you can kind of see what that fracture looks like. This is a fracture that happened before fossilization. So the bone was probably sitting out on the surface, drying out, desiccating, kind of being broken down, may have got stepped on, maybe some of the overlying weight as more sediments were burying that, that crushed it. You know, just it's kind of in a weakened state at this point, so it got crushed and then the sand filled in. But it is a uh, post-mortem but pre-fossilization fracture. We've also got some really weird, irregular surfaces on the bone. If you look at this, it's fairly smooth, but this is really knobby and just really wonky looking. So again, we had uh, our, uh, our uh, expert over here with our, our 3D analysis. He, what he decided to do is uh, use a 3D scanner, 
and uh, take a nice scan of that surface, and I've got a video that shows you how different that is uh, from the next slide. Yeah, right here. <clears throat> It'll get zoomed in here. Focus uh, on this area and, and compare it with this that bone right there. Hard to say if it was pathology during life or pathology that happened during decomposition. It's it's uh, <laughs> to use your imagination and we'll compare it to other things. The problem with humans is we can only compare to things that we know. So we may compare these animals to what we see as mammals today, which may not be correct. <laughs> so it's uh, it's always fun to look at. Now, any anybody that's had some histology or pathology sort of background, I've asked them to, to take a look at this, and every every the very first thing that comes out of their mouth is like it looks like an infection. So this could be a possible. We're not suggesting. We're not saying that this is an infection. We're just saying that it could be. We obviously have a lot more work to do. Uh, one of my students was actually looking at this as a possibility last year as part of his research that he presented at um, GSA. We have the same thing. Uh, it's hard to see in this image, but this end of the bone right here, um, it's again a very irregular surface, very smooth going all the way down to the rest of the bone. We've also found some parallel grooves right here. We think these are bite marks, uh, probably from a theropod, a tyrannosaur of some type. Uh, again, this is work that we're, we're currently working on, but we have recognized these nice, uh, beautiful patterns in, in the bone that suggest that some damage was taking place. Uh, again, during uh, after its death, um, they, these are cool. These little puncture marks right here. These are kind of cone shape. They don't not they don't have the same sort of pattern that you saw on the previous slide. Uh, but we think that these are are bite marks, and we think that those are from a crocodile. Mm -hmm. And at, again, after after the animal died, the carcass is probably dismembered. It's probably being torn apart by scavengers and opportunists that are coming through, because Shady's not articulated. It's very disarticulated. All the bones are kind of scattered, but maintained in one general location, but they are not anatomically put together into its, its skeletal configuration. So again, we did some pretty fun work. We decided to fill this in here. Uh, what's the name of this material? We used just some sil silicone mm -hmm. material impression. So to give us this impression, it was really neat on uh, one of these, yeah, it was this one right here. We, we took a look at the shape of that, and you can kind of see how it starts to curve backwards along that surface, just like our crocodile tooth. And we have found crocodile teeth in the matrix around the bone. Again, in, in fact, this past one we found quite a bit. We found several crocodile teeth, but we also found theropod teeth too, or the tyrannosaur type teeth. So there's no doubt in our minds that this was probably scavenged on the fillet. We've got some pretty good evidence here to suggest that. Um, this was a lot of fun to do. We're currently working on um, quantifying that. And so we've got a, a math professor that, he, he's a, he likes to build games. So he's a, he's a gamer kind of guy, but he's using this technology to help us determine the probability of whether or not these teeth were actually what was responsible for causing some of the dismemberment. So the next thing is to show you, and this is kind of wrapping it up, but um, this is just to show you the distribution and what the quarry kind of looks like. And so this picture is taken in 2021. This is taken with our drone. And again, um, there's Jim's name. Um, this is, so over That's here. Fence line. This yeah, is the there's, the, there's that uh, fence line right there that was being repaired in 2019. The skull was over here. Basically what we did is we kind of worked our way this way from 2020 to 2021, and then 2022, 2023, everything kind of started to take a turn and go this way. And so I've, I'm gonna overlay uh, transparency of the first field season to show you the approximate location of the skull, where the frill was, some rib bones. This was uh, the pelvic girdle. This is part of the pelvic girdle. This was the ilium here and some vertebrae and some more ribs that are concentrated there. And then in 2021, you can see how we found the scapula, both the right and the left, and a couple more um, vertebrae as well as ribs. Then we found the femur in 2022, the humerus, and I don't have this year's added, but it, it's continuing in this direction, which is nice because that keeps us away from the private landowner right here. <laughs> so that's helpful for us. So we've got a lot, we found quite a few pieces. And you're starting to get into some tail vertebrae as well. It's interesting. Yeah. I thought I had, maybe I don't have the picture that shows all the bones um, that we have actually found. But 
In summer, we, we've got a ceratopsian dinosaur, and again, we've hypothesized it's a triceratops. There is the possibility it could be a torosaurus. We've got to look at the parietals. We haven't had a chance to get to those parietals to really see that. It's, uh, we're again hypothesizing that it has died on the floodplain. This articulation probably caused by scavenging and predation. And there is some post-mortem, so like right after it was deceased, uh, deformation to the bone. And then obviously a lot of damage even after fossilization by root damage and the expansion and contraction of those sediments. And we may have some possible pathological things. And so we're looking to see if there was osteomyelitis and uh, osteoarthritis that were present uh, it's during old animal. It's an old animal. animal. Yeah, it's, it's big, it's old. Um, so it probably experienced a lot of things throughout its lifetime. Let's see. Yeah, so what questions would y'all have? Yeah, it's a very yeah. interesting time to be, I'm sorry to interrupt you, no, to be right. involved with paleontology. You know, the digitization of things has made uh, the science different. You know, when we first found dinosaurs circa 1890, you know, they were naming things because that was their friend or, you know, it was the historic society's founder. Or, but the point being is that as we look at it now with digitization, we can literally compare digitally how these animals are related. And so this new science of cladistics is not just looking at, you know, we have these ideas about where animals come from and scales, but now we're able to actually do it digitally and it's changing the way we look at things. The other neat thing about it is, and the reason we brought this is, this is a direct scan of this a big L2 that was found in Wyoming. Um, and it's, it's probably, Allosaurus is probably the most found dinosaur in America, there's a huge quarry that had literally thousands of individuals in a big fluvial plain again. And so we really have looked at this well, but you know, this was digitized and 3D printed in Lithuania and sent us from Switzerland. So when I went to Switzerland, Lithuania back to Arnold, it was great, you know. But uh, it's so, it, it's really an interesting time and it gives us an opportunity to see things in a new light. Okay, <laughs> right. Um, did you find any fish scale or uh, fish teeth by any chance? We a lot of uh, scales, and then it's all of our scales that we found. Okay. And they're everywhere. Yeah. Everywhere yeah. in the state. Yeah. Pretty, pretty good size of our scale. Uh, it's about sure. And you just, you just like, look for pollen? Uh, no, we haven't uh, processed anything for pollen. I'm just curious. We, you know, we've considered that. We've also considered like looking for diatoms as well. Um, just again, try to help kind of reconstruct a uh, more complete picture of what that is. Yeah. What we found this summer is amazing, though, because we found this log that's not decomposed. And it's, it's def it was certainly the dam for all of us. And what we'll find adjacent to that will be worth looking at on the microscope. That's going to have some stuff in it. And that log was from that time period? Yeah, we can see the way it sits. It's sitting on the uh, clay layer. Uh, it didn't get there any other way, yeah. Yeah, what, what, what I'm, you know, this is kind of like what I've come up with. I showed you the, the cross beds, and so that's, it looks like the water's moving from west to east uh, at that particular location. And what we've noticed is that on the west side of the bones, we're, that's where we're finding these logs that are kind of trapped on the west side. So what logs are going to flow, but the water's not going to be able to move the bones. They're going to be too heavy, too big. And so they're going to act as kind of like a dam. And what we're also finding on the west side of the bones are more coarse-grained, like granular pieces that are they're bigger than sand, but it's they're kind of they're probably rolling on the on the uh, on, on top of the, the top of the surface of the floodplain during that flood stage. All the sand's being deposited around, but the coarser stuff's getting trapped behind uh, the bones off to that west side along with the logs. So it's creating almost a kind of like a little log chain because as we kind of worked over this year, we found several. Pretty good sized logs. I mean, we couldn't even get the one out this year. It's, it's there for next year. It's, it's made this site so sandy. I mean, it, you'd never find a place where you can excavate with a paintbrush. And that's yeah. literally how it can be. It's amazing to see. We're spoiled. <laughs> <laughs> so, so no, go ahead, Mike. Go ahead. Uh, you were talking about the wood. Are you saying that, it, that it's still wood? Or are you saying that it's it's interesting how it looks because it's so, um, well, I'll let David answer that one. I, I, it's, I mean, is it petrified or is it still organic? It's carbon, it's, it's carbonized. It's, it, but it's retained a lot of its textural, structural um, features to it, which is really neat. 
Um, but yeah, most of it's carbonized, and, and what we've noticed, I, the one log I'm not sure, what's interesting, like, I, I've seen logs out there that on the outside, they're, they are carbonized. And as you kind of work your way in, it transitions into silicon. So it goes from this very crumbly, carbonized to very hard inside. Um, and so some the amber inside of that, it's just awesome. Right, right. Um, some, you know, some have suggested that, that could show like forest fires and things like that. So we've got some work cut out for us to, to kind of test those ideas for sure. Is it our car anymore? I'm oh, sorry. Is it our car? Do you see more stuff? I don't, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I, we, with a lot of amber, it's just going to be a funky coat. Right, right, right. We would like to get um, some yeah, thin sections of, of the pieces that we have so we can get a look at those, the, um, the cellular structure inside. Yeah. The so fact that the bones suddenly take that right turn, do you think? Or, anyway, <laughs> do you think that's a bend in the string, maybe? You know, I don't know if that's an artifact of the stream or if it's an artifact of the scavenging. It could be, it could be, it could be a combination of both. And anatomically, it's almost as if the animal sat down and its head got pulled off. I mean, when you look yeah. at how we're finding the bones, right? It's very interesting. It was scavenged, but it doesn't. It, it makes too much anatomic sense to think it was moved too much because yeah. the ribs are all sitting in that place and yeah. they're all aligned. Yeah, yeah I agree. I, the, the, the vertebrae and the ribs that make up the vast portion of the thoracic cavity, they're kind of all there, and that's central that the heads pulled far apart. Uh, the, the left frill is broken off, and it's the left frill that has those groove marks on it. So that, I, to me, that could be an indication it got dragged. My understanding is that somebody has, has also looked into uh, scavenging of theropod dinosaurs, and they were not like all these just crushing it and obliterating the bone, they were actually pulling it, and you can see these groove marks that are preserved. Um, they're just moving it and, and just trying to dismember it so they can get to various pieces or various parts of the flesh. That, 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 that brings up something for me. When we look at, at how bird-like these are, you know, <clears throat> allosaurus in particular, probably the way they fed, I mean, it's amazing to think of an animal this big was delicate, but I think of it as delicate. The way they chewed and the shape of their you know, when you think about how thin that is relative to what it looks like this way, this, you know, the models of feeding are poking, like pecking like a bird. And when you look at the wounds on some of the predation, it certainly is evidence of that. So that's, that behavior is just amazing to me. It's so interesting to see a kill site like this, you know? Have you found any fossils of crocodiles up in that area? Just the teeth. Just the teeth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I, I have a hadrosaur in my garage that I, I've got in Baker, Montana, and it, it's where it was found. It's all articulated. It probably fell into a bog. It was probably killed waterside to a bog where there were probably, you know, pseudomimus crocodile, crocodilians killing it. And when you look at the wounds on these animals and we found in the skull, the nose is gone. And it's... I don't wonder, I always wonder about shade because the nose is missing, you know. And so when I look in the skull jacket on this hadrosaur, it's missing its nose, but in the same skull jacket, we found the chin piece from the triceratops in a hadrosaur skull jacket. And so we know probably it was probably a kill site for some of the crocodiles. And those animals that fell into a bog then became fossilized and weren't predated. But the funny thing about this animal is it fell in on its left side, the left side's all there, the right side is completely missing. <laughs> and all of the ribs and all of the vertebrae are still in articulation. So you know it fell in, probably got predated, and then fell into the bog and fossilized. And so that's going to be a fun one to study as well. It's just amazing to see it. You see it in the field jacket, still articulated. It's amazing. Yeah, I found the crocodile skew. I forgot about that. That's one of the dermal bones. We're finding all kinds of aquatic um, toe bones and things too, and some of those may be, you know, there small theropods and turtles, and could be some alligators as well. It's hard to say. So, so you think that maybe there it was a feeder creek or river, but it's, it's got to be near the inland sea. I forget the name. It was mm -hmm. called, right? Yeah. Isn't the sea shoreline kind of near that area? Probably pretty close. Yeah. So this is probably a feeder 
Street. Kind of right. Street street into the Gulf right. of Mexico right. idea. Yeah. But not that big. But yeah, right. Draining out toward that. that, yeah. that, that and ocean. where it is, it's, it's, it's very, you know, the problem geologically with Hell Creek is it's, it's hard to define it because it, a lot of it was underwater. So it's, it's really kind of not clear. <laughs> we were out with, uh, with the Fleetwood School of Mines this summer, and it was really interesting to go out with them and look at all the stratification. It really was informative. What we realized is that pretty much it's somewhat of a guess, and you hope you find the right layer, and then you, you work there. And when we prospect, I mean, it's funny, David prospected for eight years before I got there, and it was very interesting, some of our other prospect sites we found some new stuff this summer, which will be interesting. There were probably, we may have found the Pachycephalus for the summer. It's kind of what it looks like size-wise to us. And it'll be interesting. It's always fun every year. It's like Christmas for me to get, get to open these packages, you know. <laughs> we do have a second Triceratops site, too, that was, uh, they began excavation on it last year, last summer. My colleague who was overseeing that site, uh, his mom was really sick and wasn't able to make it this year, but um, I don't think that one is is in good as condition as the shady is, um, but um, yeah, we're we're starting to hit some some pretty good and exciting pockets of, of interesting things. Mm -hmm. It's amazing how much you can see from the air with drones now. Yeah, how much area you can cover that before you had to do a foot and map it out, but just like you're documenting how the bones are laying there with a the drone, so mm -hmm. that's very interesting. Yeah, that technology has been really interesting. We, we, we have a Nebraska site as well, and it's a, it's a 30, 32 million year old site. It's White River stuff. And what we decided to do is we took drones to, to see, just test this technology to see if it could help us in the prospecting. And so uh, we used a drone that had different sensors to pick up different mineral contents in the soil. And we were seeing if like places of known locations where there was bone resting on the surface, if that was something that could be picked up. So we could use drones this kind of technology to help us prospect. Maybe get rid of the days where you have to walk in, you know, 10 miles before you find something at all, and you can just use a drone maybe then to do that. But we weren't really successful with that. Again, that's, I think, something that can develop over the future. The guy in the one, the, your date that you did for the amount of source, that was in stone, wasn't it? Was it sandstone? Oh, you mean for the, the Triceratops store? Uh-huh. It's similar to what they were doing there, similar. Reformation. Well, ours is Lance Creek Formation. The Triceratops I worked on for the Science Center was from Lance Creek. Oh, right. Was that Montana then? Um, Wyoming. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So is that stone that you're working? They're getting in sand, but did you? Oh, oh that's got kind of mudstone out there. It's, it's not too hard, but what we got down for our site is you want to work on it, you put a drop of water, you take a little pointed skewer, and you work it really nice. And, so we're kind of spoiled like you guys too in a slightly different way. Yeah, and it's it's and I can tell you that you know depending on the site, you know, you know we I work on some sauropod, I mean sauropod in Morrison Formation, which is which is Triassic to Jurassic era time frame, and you know when it's when it's three hundred million years old, you know it's uh, it's a lot harder. <laughs> it's rock. Really hard. Yeah. 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 And those guys, I have a lot of respect for them. They spent a long time getting to this stone. <laughs> how, how many triceratops would you say have been found in North America? Oh, are there hundreds? You, I, I, you if know. you ever would like to, to read about that, read about John Bell Hatcher. He's the first guy to know the term ceratopsian. And, and it's, uh, he worked with uh, Marsh, um, and he was the guy. I mean, if, 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 I'm trying to think who wrote the definitive book on him, but he worked through Yale and uh, just amazing guy. And, and he found literally train cars full of ceratopsian bones. He probably found a hundred himself. Oh, it's talking so, about that monograph, it's about this thing. Right. Yes. Yeah. 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 What that actually that was involved with that? I mean, yes. Yeah. 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 He wrote it and then they completed it after. After he died, he died young, sadly. I think that's some beautiful pictures in here. Oh, it is. Oh, we use illustrations. Yeah, yeah, they're really beautiful. I bet that probably benefited you with the skull. I, 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 I watched know. you all do that excavation. That was great. Well, when like I science did science center, center, yeah, yeah. yeah. Our school, I don't think it's that good of a skull, but what was cool was behind it. There's a, a log. It was a log jam. 
but all the beautiful leaves and seeds and stuff, oh, that's I worked all those out perfectly on there. So to me, the behind the skull is cooler than the, I mean, the horns are missing, so we had to redo that. The snout's always missing. We had to redo that. And uh, so, but all the vegetation was really cool. There's a wonderful video online in, in the University of Leiden. They have reconstructed a, a big triceratops from Wyoming and they've, it's, you can get the STL files digitally now. They've, they've re-digitized the whole thing and rebuilt it. And that's just a wonderful video to watch if you want to look for that. Yeah, you showed one bone, I think it was a bird, but maybe not the, the teeth marks in it were kind of almost like the dot dash, dot dash. Is that what I was seeing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've got a, a bird in the other room I want to show you that has this dot dash, dot dash going across it, and I'm sure it matches it just from here. It looked really, I hadn't seen it before. Mm -hmm. Instead of a straight scratch, it looked do -do 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 like that, and that's the way yours looked there. The neat thing about digitizing it is we can actually compare it to all the teeth in the collection to see, find out what species was doing that. Huh. You know, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, that's, that's the, again, what I was trying to mention earlier. That's kind of what we're working on right now. Um, yeah, I'd love to see that piece. That's great. And what we've actually noticed is that that's not the only vertebrae. The, the, the newer ones that we're prepping, we're seeing puncture marks on those as well. So um, I can just, I can kind of, it's like when I watch those documentaries, like in the African savannah, when the crocodiles are coming up and there's a carcass and they're just ripping it apart, I'm kind of like, oh, that's probably, you know, probably very similar to what's happened even in the late Cretaceous. And in, in my, in, in the Hedger <laughs> store that I'm working on, there's a lot of, uh, Tyrannosaur teeth fragments all over, it, all chipped up, you know. And dinosaurs were interesting, you know, they, you know, they regrew their teeth, so they, we call them spit teeth. If they broke teeth up, they grew back more teeth, so. Wow. To go back to your question, I, I, I want to say there's probably, you know, when I last looked, um, this number is sticking in my mind, um, but I want to say there's at least 50, between 50 and 60 some triceratops skulls that they have. Okay. Um, at various stages of completeness. I think the most complete that's accessible to the public as far as a skeleton would be done that's housed in, in Houston. And I think that's about 75% complete. Um, we're getting pretty close. I, I, we're, we've got a lot. We found the rest of the pelvic, or a lot of the pelvic pieces this summer, and more limb bones. And so with each passing year, we get more and more complete. So it's, which is surprising to me considering like how disarticulated it is. Mm -hmm. How often are you digging at that site? Um, so we spend, you know, we've been out there every summer since uh, the discovery yeah. in 2020. This so we've been out there every year. And right we spend well, anywhere between two, 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 two weeks to a month. Uh -huh. This is the oldest life on Earth, right? Yeah. yeah. It, it, it depends on how long my wife lets me stay. Oh, I understand that. Thanks, Australia. Mm -hmm. Uh, and your degree uh, is paleontology? It's a geology, uh, geology uh, with an emphasis in paleontology. So 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 not so much engineering, so you didn't know what size wheels to put under that pallet? No, <laughs> that, was not, that was not me. <laughs> They're amazing. But I did question them, like, are you sure that's going to work? Oh yeah. yeah. god, it's, it's designed it's to hold this and not your hair. And I didn't think that's very Bruce Nichcomer out that was, that was, this was his thing, it was early on, was already, and he had. It's just amazing to think about how the geology of the world has changed. Oh yeah. You know, it's, uh, yeah. This is from Adelaide, came from Australia, it's they estimated to be 3.75 billion years old, the first life in the, in the pre-Cambrian area, and it's just hard for humans to relate to, you know, the, I always ask my students what came first, T-Rex or the Rocky Mountains? Well, the easy answer is Rocky Mountains, right? It's, it's uh, you know, it's, but then you ask on a sauropod, what came first, the sauropods or Rocky Mountains? Well, sauropods came first, and that's hard to imagine that we're closer in time to Triceratops and T-Rex than T-Rex was to Allosaurus or the big sauropods, Dino the dinosaur, you know? And that's just hard to conceive of. <laughs> It's, it's amazing. Time is a long thing that we don't do well. <laughs> we got to have it today, right? A question about the pollen. With mm -hmm. the, 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 like the matrix that you're working in here, it's, 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 you said, very sandy. Yeah. I wonder if a lot of that is washed away as compared to a finer, like a clay, a finer particle that would contain that, preserve it. 
Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. What do you think about it? Yeah, that's really, that's kind of out of my wheelhouse. Um, I, it, it's a good question. I, I really don't know the answer uh, to that. We, we uh, with the students in the first year, we were so excited. We weren't really looking at everything, but sure. in the last couple of years, we've started to look at all the concretions, you know. Uh -huh. And it's interesting, worldwide, we never found mammal fossils, and everybody wondered why until they started breaking up the concretions, and then the mammal fossils were in there because mm -hmm. of time and whatever minerals in the, in the water. Mm -hmm. And so, we found some really wonderful theropod or, or turtle bones inside those concretions. So we have a sifter and we sift at the, we don't, we need more time to do it, but we do sift looking for many things like the bar scales and, and uh, Yeah, I know the years we have sampled the sediments. So we do have samples of those with the idea and the intention to evaluate those more closely for mm -hmm. things like pollen and diatoms. We just haven't gotten yeah. there yet. So. Sure. We just need to have you on with us. We have a project. Oh, yeah. 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 If you're willing to look at it, I'd be happy to send you. <laughs> you know, uh, I happen to be down at the science center. The guy was working down there at yeah. the times. And uh, Dr. Proctor happened to be down there that day. And the one thing he was really impressed with was, man, was this whole, <clears throat> the whole ecology of this is here. And he says, you just don't see that as far as how they work things out there. Yeah. We were talking about that driving down, you know, um, for me, I love the concept of paleobiology. And yeah. so we get focused on dinosaurs, but the reality is there was other things that are life yeah. happens because of what they could eat, right? right. Yeah, it's plants first, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think there's fig seeds in there, I think. Um, there was gar scale. Uh, Hey, guy, are you in here? Yeah. <laughs> what else did they find in that in the ecology? There's a log of some sort. Mm -hmm. Well, you talking about the Gunnister site? No. No. The one you did for the science site. Oh, the Lakes Creek. Oh, my goodness. It was fixed. Fixed. That pollen check was crazy. There was, there was dog, I remember, thousands of plants in that sandstone. And we had our uh, play checked at the Gunnister site there. It's almost nothing. It's only very recently that they found there's some little areas. It seems like we have power. And uh, so it's really weird. It's why we don't understand why. We found a crocodile, right? Yeah, a piece of crocodile. Wait a minute. You, you, are you telling me that they actually have found pollen now? He told me that he had sent samples off to a, another lab where it was, you know, Mario Cross. He was kind of old school guy. Uh -huh. Okay, well, he said now they're finding the organic areas that seem like it does have power. So well, that's, that's a new episode, you know? Yeah. That's the funny I mean, it's hard for me to throw any of the dirt away after we clean and stuff up. Well, you got to look through it under a microscope. Oh, yeah, it's a, a, lot of display, a lot of uncertainty about the exact age, and pollen would really help to nail that down. But I hadn't heard this before. It just happened. I just talked to Pete. He said he sent yeah, some yeah. samples yeah. off, and it was a little, little, little dark. Oh, yeah, it's all <laughs> It's really neat. But yeah. is there kind of flora in here other than the log? No, we found some seeds as uh, well. Um, we put those aside. Um, you know, it's so, so much organic debris. It's, it's, it's hard to identify what it is. Yeah. Uh, but we again, we've, we've kept a lot of the sure. stuff just for later analysis. Right. In the hedge store, there are leaves everywhere. Uh -huh. And that's really been fun trying to identify the species. I have probably 20 different species that I've pulled out and we've preserved, and we just need to have time to study them. Yeah. yeah, those are way better preserved than what we got to show you. And it's, it's more mud and stone, so it preserved it better, whereas the water went through this because it was sand. Right. <laughs> the burning question is is this the real slim shape? <laughs> We've been trying to get him to fund us for a while. Yeah, I don't know when that was going to come up. Uh, slim, probably not. <laughs> but it's it's wonderful to be up there. It's uh, it's it's you know if y'all want to come, you're welcome to come and hang with us for a bit, and to come and see Mount Rushmore and uh, and see the geology that's affiliated with the Badlands and just an amazing place. We enjoy being there. A lot of people have asked like, where we are in relation to the boundary, and the boundary has not been resolved in South Dakota very well. Um, and those guys who came out this summer, um, other people have been looking at this for several years, we just haven't been able to really locate the boundary. Where that, when I say boundary, I'm talking about that mass extinction event. Um, 
uh, even the those those guys that have been working out there for decades just still don't have a good idea or handle on that. And we just sat there, well, we spent half a day just looking at, at our field site, looking at the different layers, trying to envision what that was. And multiple so, sites. Oh, right. like, yeah, well, yeah, multiple sites. Because one, the one group from uh, the School of Mines, they were they were on um, the lakes uh, up there, and they were going around the the, the exposures of rock uh, on by boat and uh, trying to try, try to get a better, better handle on that. And, didn't really have great success with that. Isn't that Canis site in South Dakota? Site that's in North Dakota. Yeah. And it, you know, it's what's interesting and very close to us is the, the Heritage Museum there in Bismarck. That's worth going to see. They have a completely mummified Atlantosaurus. It looks like it's laying there alive. It's just amazing. And it's a travel the world. And I was back and I finished the prep on it. To go in their prep lab is really neat. And they do have a a site that they believe is one of these boundary sites that they're working on right now. So it's, it's, there's going to be some more news, I think, soon about that. Yeah, the tank site is amazing. That's just incredible. Um, that's just a moment in time. Uh, like tech types being uh, aspirated in the gills in the fish. Right. And tech types in the amber. That's nuts. I mean, it's just such a yeah. layer. Yeah. Yeah. That's quite a discovery. It really is. Um, we're going to learn a lot from that. <laughs> a lot. But that's a wonderful place if you're ever in the region to go and see as well. That's an amazing museum. That's nice. The, the head paleontologist is really nice to talk to, and those people are all wonderful. Yeah. Really nice. Any other questions? Well, we, we appreciate you coming. We, we encourage you to come and prep with us. We can use you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. And it's, it's been wonderful. This is a great facility. I've been past uh, St. Jimmy several times and never come into town. Um, just This is a really impressive facility, so thank you so if much. If you're ever going to be in Fulton, Missouri, come and see Shady. It's, uh, it's, it's yeah. available to see, and we're trying, to, we're trying to work on a better, we'd love to have this there. Can we move this there? <laughs> <laughs> if you'd like to pick up the debt, <laughs> please take our debt. I got it. <laughs> Well, we really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Great. 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 I don't know if he has any of the problems here mm -hmm. from the site, but uh, there's, a, there's a little Asian. What's, what's her name? Actually, you know, the field museum. I think the field museum. Yeah. I'm holding it, and it's just, it's weird. It's not well, like it's fully. There are dinosaur bones in the front line where I found stairs. And they're the same way. Mm -hmm. You get something oh, yeah. in a real light. It's That's so interesting. It? It's kind of like your piece of wood you're talking yeah. about in a way. I had yeah. one of the most carbon dated yeah. Gillette one time and Gillette went to the air. That's twice the same. <laughs> we did. But that was an exceptionally light one. I think mm -hmm. some of the yeah. nails had been leached out of it. But okay. I mean, it's almost like a, a plastic uh, cast. You know? But here was sort of a solid head. Right? It, it's all structurally yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. All those mastodon bones are half the weight of any of these Cretaceous. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Okay. Huh. It's, that's, it's easy to see the difference when you're standing. And then you pick up one of those sauropod bones. I have a sauropod vertebrae that probably weighs 70 pounds. Yeah. 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 Huh. Those, it's hard to imagine those creatures too, those titanosaurs. Oh, yeah. yeah. And that's the other thing that's happening right now. We're finding so much more because of global warming. A lot of these, especially up in the Arctic, finding, you know, I, I recently had an experience. Uh, I went to a Selkirk gallery here in St. Louis, which sells, it's like a big auction house. And one of the things in the auction was, it looked like a dinosaur tooth. And my daughter saw it online, so we got to look at this thing. And when we went, we bought it. And it is absolutely a Tyrannosaur too. But it was found in the Inuit villages. They had carved it into a tool. And they had it there. And it's probably some form of troodon. But you think about it, it's hard to imagine that the world being warm and that they were dinosaurs in the Arctic and the Antarctic. But the best, right. the best sauropod stuff is in South America and Antarctica. When the ice, some of the ice fields will see more and more. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's the one with the brake marks. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, it's from the Missouri Dinosaur. RSRs. 
And there's very few uh, well, that's quotation marks that we found. It's kind of odd that there's very, very few. Right. On the correct belt. Should, should be the correct belt. 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 You think yeah. that's where the tooth raked across the surface? That's, the, that's what it looks like. Yeah, it does, yeah. <laughs> that's really neat. With so many dinosaurs there, you'd think that they'd all be made up. And they were mostly skeletons, were almost seven turtles, prickly turtles. Mm -hmm. Skeletons were all these turtles. That's amazing fossil uh, classification. I was in the past, I almost want to show them. I'm not going to, I don't want to interrupt you guys talking, no, so no, I'm going to wait <laughs> Wait for it done. And the problem we have is this stuff is heavy, so it's hard to carry around. That's why we bring the light 3D printed. <laughs> so, how are you fellas doing with shape as far as assembling it or it, it, it uh, what's the best, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, you said come down and see it. It's, out. It, it's not as heavy as it is. Pieces and parts, you know, we have probably, well, that's what we're doing right now is we teach prep course and so one of us students, you, you don't plan to actually put it together. Oh, I think we'd like to mount it. You know, really? We're talking about it. Yeah, that would be our goal. Yeah. yeah, as complete as it is, I think it would be pretty neat. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay. Construction. Okay. Yeah. Ideally, it, sh it would be scanned and 3D printed and uh, uh, yeah. put up where you can just put right. it together. You know? right. yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that, yeah. mm -hmm. it's, it's, and that's just a science unto itself. The yeah. art of doing display, and we talk about that a lot as well. Right. You know, like here, you know, with this guy's done with the stuff downstairs. Yeah. You know? One thing I like about you guys is you're not saying this is positively, that you, there's a lot of unknown, and I like that. If you don't know what it is, don't claim it. You know no, what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah. I'm saying pseudoscience. Yeah. You guys are, you know, you're not... We agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so. <laughs> I think it's good to have ideas, but you definitely have to test those. Right. You have to make that known that this is a, this is a hypothesis, this is an idea. Mm -hmm. um, you learn that the hard way because every time you think you found something, you you learn different, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, so, which is really good. Yeah. <laughs> Makes it even more fun. Those yeah. people that can commit right away, uh, it's impressive to me. I can't do that. Yeah, I, mean, yeah. I gotta have, I gotta have more evidence of that. Yeah. It's like trying to walk those fourth graders through the Hall of Giants downstairs and tell them what kind of dinosaur. They'll correct you like that. And then they'll spell it. Fourth graders, you know? And we weren't not to commit. We realized that we live in arrested development. We're still in fourth grade. I've, I've done a lot of presentations, and uh, the harshest critics, like the, the harshest uh, group that I critically, was my daughter's. Um, Preschool class. They were all experts, and they were they were they were letting me have it. I walked out of there and like I don't think that went very well. They were just helping me out. And, you know, yeah. They were harshly critical. I'm not coming back. Yeah, but it truly really is an exciting time because the the science is really giving us more information. It seems like the more you know, the less you know, right? Right. Uh, that always be. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we should have fun of it. We encourage you to join us if you would like to you know, have some of the Well, we sure appreciate you guys volunteering to come down and do this for us. Yeah. 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 It ties in well with Guy's work here. It does. And uh, really interesting stuff. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for having us. Appreciate it. Yeah, we appreciate the opportunity. We always love to talk about paleobiology and time frame stuff, and it's just, maybe we can do it again. We well, could pick something you'd like to have talked about. Yeah. We hope to have you back. Yeah, yeah, we have to come back. You might want to visit one time when, the, when they're digging out there. That'd be great. It's only an hour that. away from here. I mean, Missouri is now dinosaur country. Yeah, that's right. That's what they thought, you know, the yeah. process. So. Yeah. And we really do got a good site. And they, the fellow that owned it, who just died, unfortunately, uh, he had turned that site over to four or five of us to see it into the future. So. Yeah. I mean, even the, even the state of Missouri is actually trying to snatch it from us at one time, asking if we'd sell it. Of course, we wouldn't. Okay. And talking about the Mansion on State Park immediately, I told him, I said, the reason I won't sell this to you is just one reason. You've had Mansion on State Park forever and you're not digging. Mm -hmm. And also, they put a pipeline through right next to that road there. Um, in front of and all that dirt was dug out. It was all, the, all full of Ice Age stuff. And I went and told the guy there. And, they were more, uh, really worried about uh, raccoons getting in the uh, trash cans, and they were. Well, anyway, 
come to find out this friend of mine went and looked at some of that, found a piece of mastodon ivory about so long it was turned into a, a tool. It is laying right there, right where the workman dug and, and mastodon. So mastodon to me, they're not digging, they're not doing nothing. They're like petrified. But I, 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 changed. I spent a lot of time trying to volunteer and offer things to them, like building a prep lab. They won't do it. That's crazy. They I don't get it. So what we're trying to do in Fulton is we're trying to develop a public interest corporation where we can have a place where we can have a repository. There's no fossil repository in the state of Missouri. And when I offer these bones up to places like the Science Center, they try to give it to the Burpee, which I'd like to have it here. You know. Science Center is not the, they're not the. Sad. They're not the one. So we're, we're working on it. I promise we're going to do that. We will get that accomplished. And you all are doing it here. I'm really impressed. Amazing. Yeah. I wish there was. It hits my mind all the time because I, unfortunately or fortunately, have a huge amount of Missouri fossils that are Missouri's treasures. And I just seen one of my friends die and what happened to his collection. I understand. And yeah, some yeah. of so it we, we know that is well. supposed to go in that direction, but some of it hasn't. And I really worry myself because we did this, but I got enough to do this again and again. I mean, it's a real worry for me. But a lot of this. I wish there was a repository in Missouri for important fossils, no matter what kind they are, or invertebrate, where they should go. And it's a big burden on me because life broke off tomorrow, just like poor Bruce, there's a huge amount of information that's going to be lost. So I, I really. Well, we work at every channel we can, and we've got a senator who's very interested right now. And so. Who? A senator? Yeah, Senator Schmidt's office is now helping us, and so we really need a repository. Yes, and, it's, we do. and it's, and you know, just what we have with Shady, and you know, a lot of the programs that are going down, you know, St. Louis Community College, and any anybody, you know, we would like to have that place where it's safe and secure. And well, our dinosaurs are going to Illinois. Nothing yeah. against them. I like Pete and a whole bunch of you know, oh, yeah. They're great, but they're Missouri's, and almost everything goes to Illinois. I mean. Uh, National State Park, Illinois. So, but we do need something. And there's a couple millionaires that I know I've been, one of them had come here and actually photographed the museum and had a, an interest in us. And you know, I've been thinking, but we do need a repository. Really and we're, we're trying to do, we'd like to have a place for centered in geology and basic real science. So, and it's, and I think we're going to execute it. And we work with the Forestry Service and they want to help us as well. So, we're going to work hard on it. I mean, we're happy to help you. And, Love to talk to So, did you fellows have a hard time where you did you have competition with other universities to get this? No. 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 Okay. Um, when I applied, I asked about that. It was uh, a possibility. Like, you would be the only one holding a permit in this area. Really? But, you know, it's a really interesting area because it's, you know, there's private, there's grazing land, there's. I think that's the crux to it. I think a lot of universities don't want to compete with the private ranchers. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but, but what we realize is they're just incredibly helpful. They want to help us. Yeah, they do. Nice yeah. yeah, really, really nice people. Yeah. Have you guys toured the museum yet? No, I want to. <laughs> we got here right before. Uh, so yeah, I'm like, I'd love to see this. So I'm very excited about it. Maybe next time we're not close. Break my heart. <laughs> Well, we appreciate your interest. Great questions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for the conversation. These guys don't like to get all of us if they would like to come and see this. Thank you.